Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Ann Cronenberg. Yes. Thank you. This is such a very exciting day for all of us. I see lots of friends in the audience, people who, who worked with Harvey, who loved him, uh, people who have come along as part of his legacy. It's just to think that we're honoring this man who is such a special part of all of our lives with a US postage stamp today is absolutely phenomenal. So thank you so much for coming here and joining us. Last week, Stuart and I were able to be at the White House for the White House de for the uh, stamp dedication, which was, you know, a wonderful event and so inspiring. But it's really, to both of us, it's more important to do it here because this was Harvey's home, and City Hall in particular was what he loved the most. I wanted to uh, introduce our, our mayor, Mayor Ed Lee, who is going to speak to you and give some opening remarks today. We're very lucky to uh, have Mayor Lee represent us here in the city of San Francisco because he really understands, um, obviously, civil rights issues, but he understands that the kinds of principles that Harvey always talked about. You know, we as individuals, um, do not have the same kind of strength or power as we do when we collaborate together. And minority groups, people of color, disabled individuals, um, uh, lesbian, gay, straight, whatever, um, really when we come together have a lot more power as a group. We, instead of being the minorities, we become the majority. So Mayor Lee, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thank you, Ann. Welcome to the People's Palace. Another wonderful occasion to see all of you, uh, but also a very unique one. I want to begin by thank you, uh, thanking Ann and Stuart for your wonderful leadership. You know, when I saw the pictures from DC, uh, and I've been there before on other occasions, this was pretty, pretty unique for San Francisco, well-deserving. Uh, not only for Harvey Milk, but for what our city has always been about and what Harvey Milk attempted to do in his short life, but one that he succeeded because look at who we are today. And if Harvey was here, I think he'd be pretty proud to see the diversity that's exhibited, not just in the elected officials, but also in our department heads, and in our own LGBT caucus at the Board of Supervisors, uh, and I think, well, I actually would know that uh, Attorney General Kamala Harris would join me in recognizing this is a very unique opportunity for our city. And to see the national stage and international stage of a stamp named after Supervisor Milk, not just any stamp, a forever stamp, a forever stamp. Rosemary, thank you for being part of that effort at the U.S. Postal Service because forever is pretty unique. It also means that we commit ourselves forever to be a city of equality and making sure we do everything we can to do what Harvey has always taught us. He saw the significance of change. He kept, he had that door opened and all he asks us to make sure we do is keep that door open when we come walking through it. And that's the commitment that we will forever do here in this great city of San Francisco. And we've seen these milestones already in our city. Just a year ago, we were right here celebrating the Supreme Court's decision on uh, DOMA and Prop, Prop 8. And then, just a few months ago, we celebrated the 10 years of what we were doing here to lay the foundation for change across the country. Lo and behold, 18 states in the United States of America have seen it correctly, and there's more to be done. More to be done. 
Today, this forever stamp puts us and puts Harvey Milk's not only face and name in history, but our city, our culture of tolerance and acceptance for the world to see and understand. We have to educate more people. We have to bring more people along. We have to keep those doors of opportunity open. And it's centered right here in this wonderful, wonderful city of San Francisco. So thank you again, Anna Stewart. Thank you to the Post Service. Thank you to all of you for being here to celebrate this wonderful, beautiful occasion. You're going to see a stamp that's you're going to have to reproduce more of these stamps because I'm there in line buying my pages uh, because I want to be part of this wonderful ex exhibition of history, but also reminder, let's keep working together. Let's keep making sure that everybody experiences this wonderful celebration and feels the power of equality. Congratulations for being here. Thank you. I'm Stuart Milk, um, often known as the nephew of Harvey Milk. And my uh, friend Ann and I are co-hosting, so we're spl splitting back and forth on introductions. Um, two years ago, we were notified by the post office that there would be a Harvey Milk stamp. And um, we had a team of the Milk Foundation is all volunteers, so we had a team of volunteers that have been living and breathing the post office for two years. Um, we had to keep a lot secret. The post office was, has to be secret. No one can know. Um, you can't tell anyone anything. Um, and, but we had an amazing group of people led by Miriam Richter, who's with us today, um, working with really an incredibly talented team of people. So if someone asked me, what quasi-governmental entities there are that has really amazingly talented and, um, and highly engaged and, and, and perspective, modern perspective folks, I would not have immediately thought of the post office. And to be honest with you, that perception was proven wrong in the last two years. These folks have been tremendous. I think everyone is very proud of that stamp. Most of that design was completely done by the post office folks. And, um, and so we are really honored to have had the Deputy Postmaster General in DC, and we're equally honored um, to have uh, Rosemary Fernandez with us today. Um, Rosemary was named Vice President Employee Resource Management in 2013, and she reports to the Chief of Human Resources um, and the Executive Vice President at the Post Office. In her role, she's responsible for United States Postal Service talent, acquisition, retention programs, training, development, diversity, personnel services, safety, health, medical programs, everything HR. Now, we have a group of people here today from the Treasure Island Job Corps Center who are all in training to get jobs. So for you guys from the Treasure Island Job Corps Center, the woman I'm about to introduce is the person to connect with when this is over. Um, please join me in welcoming someone that I've only spent a few minutes with, but I know is right at home here in San Francisco. Please join me in welcoming Rosemary Fernandez. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks, Anne and Mary Lee. Thank you so much. The Postal Service is proud to, to pay tribute to one great champion of change, Harvey Milk. And I have to say, I, I th want to thank, especially thank Harvey because we really are trying to bring cool back to the Postal Service. And I think today with this stamp, we're trying to do that. There's a lot of reasons really to admire Mr. Milk, beginning with his unique ability to bring people together. And look at the crowd here today. He would be so proud. It really started in the early 70s when he joined forces with Teamsters to boycott a beer company that engaged in anti-labor and anti-gay practices. Soon union truck drivers and LGBT people were working together, side by side, towards a common purpose. Only Harvey Milk could have made such things possible. In the years that followed, Mr. Milk expanded his coalition to include senior citizens, young people, ethnic minorities, and more. There was practical reasons, of course. Mr. Milk was a politician, and he knew he needed votes, 
wherever he could find them. But he also knew people from different backgrounds that got to know each other, discovered how much they had in common. In the most important lesson Harvey Milk taught us, everything, everyone has something that makes them different. And one group that is held down, the rest of us have the op responsibility to stand up and fight back. We all have a stake in equality. That's why Mr. Milk spent so much time urging LGBT people to come out of the closet. He knew that when more straight people knew more gay people, acceptance would prevail and over prejudice, un unity would triumph over division, and hope would conquer fear. And more than anything else, Mr. Milk gave people hope. There's one, of the, there's one of the reasons that he ran for office in the first place. But showing the world he wasn't afraid to be himself, he gave countless others the courage to take pride in who they are. That was easier said than done back then, of course. There were many dangerous times for the LGBT community. Gay people were subject to violence and harassment. No one understood that better than Harvey Milk. As one of the nation's first openly gay elected officials, he lived with that threat of death every day. Yet he never let it deter him. In fact, a year before his death, assassination, he said, and this is a quote, if a bullet should enter my brain, then let the bullet destroy every closet door. Almost 40 years later, Almost 40, 40 years later, there are far fewer closet doors today left in America. I suspect everyone in this room knows someone who's gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. There are friends, our family members, our neighbors. They teach our children. They care for us when we're sick. They help keep us safe. They deliver your mail. and represent our interests on school boards, on city councils, in state, house, uh, state houses, and in Congress. They are a part of our everyday lives, and our lives are better for it. And so that's why I'm very proud to be here today and dedicate this stamp on behalf of the United States Postal Service. The stamp reflects our long-standing commitment to diversity. Mr. Milk joins other civil rights pioneers, including Martin Luther King, Cesar Chavez, who have, been honored, who have both been honored on stamps before. And as you will see in a moment, the Harvey Milk stamp features a black and white image of him in front of the Castro Street store here in San Francisco that he owned. The picture was taken by Daniel Nicoletta. Now, now, interestingly enough, that, that picture was for his 1977 campaign, but it was rejected because the, his tie was blowing in the wind. So I think it's extremely appropriate and an iconic image that, that that picture here today is now on a postage stamp. Today it's one of, considered one of the most iconic images. And so today my Postal Service colleagues and I, eager to share this image with you with the rest of the nation through the Harvey Milk uh, Forever stamp, let it serve as a small but powerful reminder of the lessons Harvey Milk taught us. Beginning with the idea that when you're not afraid to be yourself and you give others the courage and pride in who you are, let this stamp remind us of the fundamental truth behind Mr. Milk's message and that we all have a stake in equality. And let us do something else. Let this stamp inspire a new generation to continue Harvey Milk's legacy to keep working towards a world where prejudice gives a way to acceptance and where division way to un unity and where fear gives way to hope. Thank you so much for being here today. A 
And now I would like to invite all of the honored guests to join me for the dedication of the Harvey Milk Forever stamp. So I have the great honor of introducing my uncle's campaign manager, um, a dear friend of not only um, my uncle from his San Francisco days, but a dear friend of the Milk family, and someone who actually was chosen in a political will that was just referenced to fill the seat that was vacated by my uncle's death in the event of his assassination. Um, Anne is well known in this community. She is your Director of Executive Director of Emergency Medical Services. But Anne, like me, um, has the belief that my uncle's message is needed globally. And so when we were at the White House five years ago, and Desmond Tutu, through these spectacle glasses, pointed a finger at me and said, you gotta do more. He's a martyr. There are a lot of LGBT heroes, but there are very few that knowingly put their lives on the line every day and that took bullets, and that his message can free LGBT people across the world. And I said I would only form the Harvey Milk Foundation if Anne would be willing to do that with me, and she did not hesitate for a minute. Anne is, a, is, is an inspiring leader. Um, she will bring forth humor that um, I did not inherit from my uncle, but she, <laughs> she was able to pick up whatever humor my, my uncle had and more. Please join me in welcoming really the heart and soul of my uncle's campaign days, who's taken that forward big time, Ann Cronenberg. I think we should start a new campaign, perhaps. Um, you, maybe you'll all join me, and let's make the Harvey Milk stamp a permanent exhibit here in City Hall. Don't you think that would be great? I know that's something Harvey would have loved. <laughs> Harvey, um, Harvey changed my life. I mean, with one phone call from Harvey saying, can you come talk to me? I think, you know, maybe you could work with me on this campaign. Um, I have dedicated my entire life to public service. If I had not hooked up with Harvey at that point, um, I don't, I really have no idea what direction my life would have gone, but Harvey instilled in me not only the hope that we talk about with Harvey, but the, um, it's, it's like, absolutely such a part of my core that I am here to serve the citizens in whatever role I'm in to serve the public and that that's something that is an honorable job, something that is a profession that I am very proud of and Harvey Milk did that for me. <laughs> Harvey did instill hope in us hope for the future, hope where lesbians and gay men would be treated equally with dignity and respect. Harvey said his message was come out of the closet. He was the first to say publicly, you have to come out of the closet because he knew that if friends and family knew that you were gay, knew that a neighbor next to them was a lesbian or bisexual or transgender, that that would begin to change the norms and the standards in our culture. Harvey said once they realize that we are indeed their children, 
that we are indeed everywhere. Every myth, every lie, every innuendo will be destroyed once and for all. Harvey was right. I mean, look at us now, 35 years later, his legacy of hope is taking fruition. It's becoming a reality. We see Harvey's legacy every day in our changing society. Brave men and women like Michael Sam, like um, uh, Ellen Page, like Mary Lambert, have the courage to stand up, to stand tall and declare their love. While we made really great strides here in the United States for um, equal rights for lesbian, gays, bisexual, and transgender, uh, the message is needed, Harvey's message of hope is needed so much around the world. Right now, more than one-sixth of the world's population has been recriminalized in the last year because they are lesbian or gay. That's absolutely wrong. That's why Stuart and I founded the Harvey Milk Foundation to take this message globally, around the world where people really need us. As Stuart often says, when he goes and he speaks in foreign countries, you know, he speaks, he sees the, the conditions that people live in. He sees the, um, the really the chains that are on people because they can't live their lives. They can't be, they can't be true to themselves. But he goes back home. When he leaves, the people who live in those countries continue to live there and struggle for the equality that we are beginning to take for granted here, certainly in San Francisco where we oftentimes live in a bubble. And it's a bubble that um, we love and it, San Francisco is a tremendous place, but the whole world is not like us here in San Francisco. There are many people here today that I would want to acknowledge, too many to really acknowledge, but as I said early on, um, many of you worked with Harvey during his campaigns. Um, many of you were my volunteers working precincts in his successful campaign for supervisor. Um, Rosemary already acknowledged Dan Nicoletta. Danny, you know, it's wonderful that it was your iconic image that is on the Harvey Milk stamp. I think that's absolutely marvelous. I did have the opportunity to talk to our friend Frank Robinson, who was a colleague of, of Harvey's. Um, and he's, he's not doing so great right now. I just spoke with him again this morning. But Frank said, you know, and through tears, he said, Annie, look what we've done. Look what we all have done. I never thought in my life that I would see the day when this kind of equality would be a reality and that Harvey Milk would be on a U.S. postage stamp. It's rather ironic, I think, that um, Harvey is on the postage stamp. I think it's wonderful, and I thank the U.S. Postal Service and their vision in, in allowing this to happen, if you will. But during our campaign, um, we printed one brochure, very glossy, beautiful brochure, but we did not have the postage to be able to mail it. So we had to hand deliver all of those brochures around, around the entire district. With the hills in San Francisco, who knows how many of those actually got delivered. I think Harvey is with us here today. He's shining down on us. And I think it's absolutely wonderful that Harvey is going to show up in mailboxes all around the country. People are going to open the mailboxes, and there he is. And as Mayor Lee said, it's going to be forever. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. You know, in 1979, we had our first um, 
memorial remembrance for my uncle. And I was in school in Washington, D.C. And I went to a memorial at uh, Lambda Rising, which is a LGBT bookstore in Washington. And there were a lot of protesters. Um, the protesters about my uncle's legacy have died down some, but they're still out there. By the way, there's a group that's boycotting the post office called the Family Research Council. Very small voice, very small minds, um, but it's still out there. But the protesters outnumbered those of us that were celebrating my uncle's life. And there was a woman, taller than me, huger than life, that I met for the first time. Her name was Dr. Maya Angelou. And she saw that, and we lost her today, and she saw that being that I lost my uncle and a family member, she reached out to me. And she made one of the first quotes that, she, why, that she's widely quoted on LGBT rights, but she was there to support my uncle's legacy. She was there to support LGBT people. And she got up and she said, I am gay, I am lesbian, I am black, I am white, I am Christian, I am Jew, I am Muslim, I am human. That has stayed with me to this day. She didn't rehearse that. She didn't plan that, it just flowed from her. And so we get to meet people who justice and righteousness flow from. We get to meet people who, when in a position of authority and power, like being the Attorney General of a state of California, have a choice. Do I defend a discriminatory law that creates second-class citizenships, or do I say, no, as Attorney General, I will not defend that. By the way, the Supreme Court decision striking down Prop 8 was because no one had standing to defend that law, and that was because of our next speaker, the Attorney General of California, Kamala Harris. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. First of all, let me just say it's so wonderful to be home. <laughs> um, thank you, Stuart, for your, for your leadership and, and all that you do to make sure with Anne that we keep Harvey's memory alive. And through you both, he lives. And through you both, you inspire us all to keep that hope alive. And, um, and you know, that is that extraordinary saying that is so well associated with Harpy. Uh, you gotta give him hope. And you know, when, when he spoke those words, as we all know, it was an extension of what he felt in his heart and in his soul and in his mind, which is hope. But he saw the word hope as being a, a, a verb. <laughs> For him, it meant action. Hope meant action. And so that was the life that Harvey Milk lived. He lived a life that was about recognizing that through that action, he would be a voice for very voiceless and often voiceless and often helpless people. Harvey Milk was somebody who understood the strength of holding a position of public trust in these public offices and embodied what it means to be courageous in doing work that needs to be done unburdened by the popularity of the work at hand. And in that way, and I know I can speak for myself and all of the electeds and all of the, the leaders here in saying that we, like this stamp, are part of Harvey Milk's legacy. And it has been mentioned, but I think it needs to be repeated often, that part of Harvey's genius was the commitment that he had to the importance and the influence of coalition building. 
As many of you knew and know, I, I am a daughter of the Civil Rights Movement. My parents met when they were active in marching for civil rights in Berkeley and Oakland in the 1960s. So I grew up right in this Bay Area, and I grew up knowing of and about Harvey Milk. I grew up in an environment, as did we all, understanding that there is so much that binds us all, but we must make a commitment and then act on that commitment to work together in a coalition toward our collective goal, which is for justice and equality for all. Harvey lived that kind of life, but I did not know Harvey personally. However, I did personally know and work with and stand here before you today because of the work of a man named Jim Rivaldo. Jim Rivaldo was my campaign manager when I first decided to run for district attorney of San Francisco. And I will tell you, when I first decided to run for district attorney of San Francisco, we started out at a very healthy six points in the polls. <laughs> That's six out of 100 for those who are uninitiated. And no one thought it could be done. And Jim Rivaldo would sit me down in his office over in McAllister Towers and tell me we could get it done. And he would tell me over and over and over again about the stories and the work of Harvey Milk. He would talk about Harvey Milk's commitment to justice and to civil rights and to believing things can get done in spite of what has been done, that we can see the world as it can be unburdened by how it has been. And so when I stand here in City Hall today as your Attorney General, the top cop of the biggest state in the country, <laughs> I stand, I stand on the shoulders of many people, including Harvey Milk. And so then when I was able to be here on June 28th, 2013, to perform the marriage of an extraordinary couple, Kristen Perry and Sandra Steer, and perform that marriage right up there on the balcony, I stood there on the shoulders of and in the legacy of Harvey Milk. And in doing the work, that we have accomplished, I know we all have a great reason to fill this place, this historic place called San Francisco City Hall, with celebration. But we also know, and this is the beauty of everything that is being done and all the work that continues to be done, we also know that in dedicating this stamp, it's about rededicating ourselves to the ongoing struggle for civil rights and equality for all. So I join everyone here today in being very humbled about being able to be a part of this celebration, humble to be part of the legacy of Harvey Milk, and dedicated and rededicated to the fight for civil rights and equality for all. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney General Harris. That was very inspiring. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce two of our current supervisors on the Board of Supervisors, uh, Scott Weiner, who actually is the supervisor uh, from Harvey's old district, uh, which used to be District 5, and Supervisor David Campos. Um, Attorney General Harris spoke of the legacy of Harvey, and when I see all the electeds who have been elected over the years, the numbers are tremendously huge throughout the country. Really, it is on Harvey's shoulders. I feel very proud of the fact that we were there with him when he was the first gay elected official here in San Francisco, and you know, possibly. Um, throughout the country, openly gay. So, supervisors, would you like to come up and say a few words? Thank you, Ann. Let's hear it for Ann Cronenberg.
And I just want to acknowledge a few of our colleagues who are here, Supervisor John Avalos and London Breed and Norman Yee, and also our treasurer, uh, Jose Cisneros, our public defender, Jeff Adachi, and our sheriff, Ross Mirkarimi. I know our district attorney, George Gascon, was here earlier. Um, so I was eight years old in suburban New Jersey when Harvey Milk and George Moscone uh, were murdered. And I remember growing up in the 70s and 80s, and it seemed like all you heard, at least where I was, um, was negativity um, about the LGBT uh, community and all the bad things that were happening and all the challenges. And so fast forwarding to 2014 and having Harvey Milk on a stamp that's going to be sent around this country, around the world, that people are going to pick up envelopes and see that smiling face, whether they want to or not, it is just absolutely amazing. And you put it in the context of what our community has been able to achieve around marriage equality and passing multiple pieces of legislation for our community through this United States Congress. Imagine that, it's amazing. But we still have so many challenges as a community. Uh, we know that HIV is not over, that people are still struggling, getting sick, dying. Uh, we know that our transgender brothers and sisters are still struggling with health care, with employment, with their own personal safety. We know that our kids and our seniors are still struggling. But if there's one thing of the many things, if there's one thing I have learned about our community is that this LGBT community knows how to take a punch and keep moving forward. This community survived the HIV AIDS epidemic and we survived Harvey's tragic murder, we survived Matthew Shepard's murder, and we will survive everything that they throw of us at us. And Harvey taught us that, and this stamp is another step forward, and I am just so proud about where this community has come from and where we're going, and so let's keep fighting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Weiner. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for being here. Uh, acknowledge, of course, the Postal Service, uh, our mayor, our attorney general, and I especially want to acknowledge the incredible work of the Harvey Milk Foundation with Stuart Milk and Ann Cronenberg. Thank you very much for continuing to, to spread this message uh, worldwide. I know that Supervisor Weiner acknowledged uh, some of our colleagues. I want to acknowledge a couple of uh, former members of the Board of Supervisors, uh, Carol Ruth Silver, who served with Harvey Milk, and of course, Bevan Defty, who also represented the district that Harvey Milk represented. I, I'm very, I'm very pleased that Attorney General Harris mentioned Jim Rivaldo because I do think that uh, Harvey getting to where he was was possible uh, for so many people. And I do agree that the best way to honor Harvey Milk is to rededicate ourselves to his uh, work for social justice and equality. But I want to be very frank about what, what we mean when we say equality. I think it's great to talk about equality under the law, and I think that's very important, and we certainly want everyone to have the same legal rights. But that's not just the, the, the equality that Harvey Milk was talking about. The equality that Harvey Milk talked about was also the equality when it comes to the social economic conditions under which people live in this city and in this country. And by... And by that measure, as much as we have come very far on legal equality when it comes to social economic equality, we still have a ways to go. We in San Francisco have accomplished a lot, but yet I stand here to, uh, before you today living in a city that has the fastest growing inequality in the entire country. We are second right behind Atlanta in terms of being the second most unequal city in the country and very soon we will overtake Atlanta. And I think that if we really are committed to the legacy of Harvey Milk, we need to rededicate ourselves to closing that inequality gap because it is not consistent with the principle of equality that Harvey died for, for us to live in a society where there's such a big difference between the haves and have-nots. And to the LGBTQ community, it is not enough for us to have equal rights under the law. We have to acknowledge that within our own community, the gap, the gap of inequality is growing. 40% of the 
of homeless youth in San Francisco are LGBTQ. 29% of homeless people in San Francisco are LGBTQ, and many of the men who survived the AIDS crisis are now being evicted from the communities that came, they came to for Safe Harbor. We want a society that is truly just and equal, but equality goes beyond the law. If we want to give them hope, let's rededicate ourselves so that San Francisco works for everyone, not just for millionaires. Thank you. When the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus was only four weeks old, they made their first public appearance on the steps of City Hall at the candlelight vigil for Mayor Moscone and Harvey Milk. From that moment, as the first chorus in the world to include sexual orientation in its name, it has courageously continued to fight the fight for equality and freedom. Please welcome members of the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus under the direction of Dr. Tim Selig.
I love the gay men's chorus. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Stuart and we'll make this really brief. I think you all know Stuart is um, Harvey's nephew. He was a teenager when Harvey was assassinated. He has taken on Harvey's mantle, which is absolutely amazing. And as I mentioned, travels around the world, spreading Harvey's word of hope and his legacy at a global level, working tirelessly overseas as a volunteer leader, inspiring hope in communities that would not have hope otherwise. Stuart. Thank you. I'm not sure that everyone got to hear the uh, the loudspeaker announcement when the chorus was introduced, but let me tell you again that uh, that their first public performance was that amazing um, spontaneous candlelight vigil that to this day is probably humanity's most eloquent response to violence that we've ever seen, and they led voice to that. And so please give me, uh, please join me in giving them another round of thanks. They, they put this together in just a week's notice. <laughs> you know, it's such an honor to be here in San Francisco City Hall with the type of diversity that's represented in the leadership in San Francisco. Uh, Carol Ruth Silver, who served with my uncle on the Board of Supervisors, is here. And, um, you know, my uncle did a lot of causes that people thought were losing causes. You know that he ran a few times and lost and then finally got elected. Well, you know, he only had 11 months, but in those 11 months he challenged a lot of existing, existing theories of what could be and dreams of what, what we can co-create. So when a man, a fellow Board of Supervisor member named Gordon Lau, decided to run for the president of the Board of Supervisors, my uncle made a point of joining Carol Ruth Silver and Ella Hutch in supporting Gordon, even though they knew they were going to lose that vote. And when he was asked, why did you do that? Why didn't you make it unanimous? for someone else. He said, because I want San Franciscans to dream that they would be an Asian president of the Board of Supervisors, and maybe we would have an Asian American mayor of San Francisco. That's Harvey's dream. He saw today what we have in this great mayor and great elected officials here. My, I get often asked, am I sad that my uncle didn't get to see the day as Ann said, when we would have all these people coming out, when we would have NFL drafts and Academy and, and Grammy award shows where same-sex couples would be married, where young people like we have from Treasure Island would be having difficult kitchen table conversations with their parents, where they would be having conversations and standing up for who they are in schoolyards and in cafeterias, and not just LGBT people, but anyone who's different, anyone who comes from a different culture, anyone whose skin is different, anyone whose religion is different or non-religion is different. These were dreams that my uncle had but he saw them in those dreams, so he did get to see today. He got to see today when this wonderful city of San Francisco would be this beaming light. And we are, in many ways, in the best of times in the West. We have an, a decision that the Supreme, not even a year old, it's almost like people think it's old hat that the Supreme Court had knocked down a ruling a, a federal 
discriminatory law called the Defense of Marriage Act, knocked it down because of a woman in her 80s named Edith Windsor who said, I am not going to take this. I am equal and I deserve liberty. She didn't have malice and thought thought. She said, I'm not going to take it. He dreamed of people like that, but he dreamed of the average person that would rise up to injustice in their own lives. He dreamed of the day that society as a whole would come together and support minorities. Like we saw in a red state like Arizona where we had a discriminatory law that passed their state house and their state senate and for the first time we've seen in the world a unanimous rise up led by corporations, led by religious organizations, led by different faith organizations, led by people of different colors who said, we will not tolerate this. Not today, not in 2014, no way. And we got a governor to veto that legislation. Historic. But as, as much as we're in the best of times in the United States, as Anne said, I spend a lot of time abroad, and we are in many ways in the worst of time abroad. So with one stroke of a pen of another court, over a billion people went backwards when India recriminalized the lives of people just because of who they love and who they are. And Africa followed suit, and we see oppression in Eastern Europe. Now, let me just share with you one of the reasons why I have global rights in my, in my experience. When I was 25, I got to go to a conference in Nairobi, Kenya. It was the ending conference of the UN Decade on Women. There was a short black Aboriginal woman who got up, and there was a room of people who looked like me at a conference of women in Nairobi, Africa. And, um, and she got up and she said, look, if you have come here because you want to help me, go home. We have nothing to talk about. If you have come here because you want to help me and people like me go home, we have nothing to talk about. You could hear a pin drop in that room. And then she said, but if you have come here because you understand your liberation is bound with mine, then let us work together. That, folks, is the answer to the global equality issue. Our liberation is bound with people in Eastern Europe, with people in Asia, with people in Africa. We have a self-interest. My uncle taught me about self-interest. Can't just be altruistic. We have a self-interest in making sure that nobody is a second-class citizen anywhere. That is the legacy of Harvey Milk. <laughs> Anne and I are going to close um, this beautiful ceremony by asking a couple of people that we have noticed that deserve recognition um, in addition to the chorus, in addition to all of our esteemed speakers, if you don't mind. Um, I think we're gonna ask some people to come up. Um, would that be okay? What do you uh, think? I think we should, I, rather than do that, I think everybody who knew and loved Harvey, because if I start saying names, well, I'm I'll gonna miss say some people. of them. Well, we've already said Bevan and Carol. Court and system. Pardon? The stamp campaign folks. So all the stamp campaign folks. Nicole, you know, was you who started the entire thing. Thank you so much. And thank you to the court. And the court system. Come on up. Okay. Well, I think we should bring. The court system. Come on up. Donna Sachet. Carol Roof Silver. Ross and everyone who knew Harvey, that was Danny, please come on up. I think we'll have a great photo opportunity. Everybody from the Milk Foundation, come on up. Equality California is here in the house, come on up. Job Corps students, the future, our future, who are being trained not only in 
vocations but in diversity. Come on up. Jose Cisneros, come on up. <laughs> Post office folks, by the way, that we've got the Postmaster General, and I've got to find these cards. I promised them that I would mention these names. James. James Waddell, come on up. I'm going to need your help. <laughs> Ross and Jera, Postmaster for San Francisco, come on up. David Stowe. Please come on up. We've got folks from the Mill Club. Come on up. Everybody who has felt something from Harvey and his legacy, please join us. Um, it's going to be a photo op for the, for the ages. So folks, come on. Danny Nicolata. <laughs> this, is, this represents, by the way, San Francisco, a mayor, a board of supervisors, and a community of people who have, the, who have in their heart the belief that we got to give them hope. The yuses, because as my uncle said, you can't live on hope alone, but without hope, life is not worth living. Thank you, Harvey. Thank you for giving us hope. Thank you, San Francisco.